Well, I will start this event. Welcome everybody to this uh, public lecture at the Nordic Institute of Latin American uh, University at, uh, here in Stockholm. Uh, and we are very happy about this event. Um, uh, first of all, let me thank you, Christina Olneval, for all the work around this event. She's the contact person responsible for the public lectures at the Institute. Uh, and I have been asked uh, to be moderator. Uh, it's it's a great pleasure for me. Uh, this is a this is a new kind of event that we are having because uh, in this particular case, we are uh, highlighting and promoting one of the articles that we have had in the last year's publication of our journal Iberoamericana, the Nordic Journal of Latin American and Caribbean Studies. And for that purpose, uh, we have selected one of the good articles uh, that were published. Uh, uh, in this case, it was by Ule Jakob Lerland, that is the main actor of this event today. And uh, it's about a hot topic, uh, which is related to religion in Latin America. Uh, we are very happy about this one because it's a very good article. It's a Nordic scholar. Uh, it is also the continuity of a line of work on research that is being done in the Nordic countries concerning this issue. Um, for, for a while, we, there, there was a special issue of Latin America, of uh, in Iberoamericana, of religion and politics in Latin America, and um, a special issue edited by Einen Bernsen and, and Marin Christ Christensen uh, in 2012. Uh, which was a great issue. You can, uh, all those um, articles are available in the homepage of iberamericana.se. Uh, so we see this as a continuation in this great line of research. And for this matter, we have invited also a very distinguished Nordic panel to comment on Ule Jakob's uh, presentation. Uh, so let me. Uh, but, but let me start first by presenting our uh, main um, presenter here, which is Uli Jakob. He's a postdoctoral researcher in theology and librarian at the University of Oslo. He has published on political theology and Latin America. Among his latest publications uh, were Global Christendom and Santi Historia by Universitets for Loget uh, from 2018, together with Viebon Jusflur and Sven Kloster and Gina Lende, Octubre Sven. Uh, today, we also have the honor to have uh, and the pleasure to have in this uh, panel as, as commenters uh, Elina Bola, uh, a long time um, distinguished person in, in these Latin American networks in the Nordic countries. Um, and Elina Bola is professor of global Christianity and dialogue of religions at the Faculty of Theology of uh, the University of Helsinki. Among her uh, latest publications, we have the, the Virgin Mary Across Cultures Devotions among Costa Rican Catholic and Finnish Orthodox by Rutledge. Uh, we also have the pleasure to welcome here George Vink. Assistant Professor of Brazilian and Latin American Studies at the University of Copenhagen, uh, we are, where he also coordinates the Center for Latin American Studies class. And uh, we're also very happy to have George Vink as a member of the Directive Board of the Nordic Institute of Latin American uh, Studies. Among his uh, most recent publications, we have Amao Invisible de Deus sobre Alianza entre Liberais e Conservadores na Nova Direita Brasileira. 
Uh, and George also had a very inter interesting uh, seminar on this topic in our research seminars recently at the Institute. Uh, so this is uh, the presentation of this uh, panel. My name is Andres Rivarola Puntiliano, and I am director of the Institute of Latin American Studies here at Stockholm University. Uh, well, having said this, I think we can go forward with uh, the seminar. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, let me just one point here. Uh, we also want to um, uh, welcome you to post questions in the chat. Uh, we will take that up in the in the latest part of the seminar. Uh, so let me just then stop the introduction and give the floor to Ule Jakobs, Jakob Löland, who will talk, uh, present uh, his theme about the new right in Brazil. Thank you so much for uh, arranging this uh, webinar uh, about the topic that uh, has uh, interested me for a long time. In October 2018, Jair Bolsonaro was elected as Brazil's new president with, this, with the explicit support from various evangelical and Pentecostal leaders in the country on earth that probably has the highest number of Pentecostal Christians. In his first public appearance after his political victory, Bolsonaro went to the church of this pastor Silas Malafaya, one of the powerful leaders of the biggest Pentecostal association of churches in Brazil, the Assemblies of God. Bolsonaro seemingly confessed during this service that he was not the most capable, but affirmed that God empowers the elected. In that way, he indirectly re referred to himself as divinely elected, which is a powerful theological idea particularly in Pentecostal theology that builds on charismatic rather than traditional or institutional authority. Malafaya elaborated on Bolsonaro's idea of divine election at the event and bolstered it with a recitation of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 to 29, and Paul's words that God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Then Malafaya went further, stating that, I quote, this is the reason why God chose you. And he pointed his finger at Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro had not only been chosen by a majority of Brazilians, in Malafaya's vision, he was also chosen by God. Two years ago, I was on a conference panel about the new Brazilian right, organized by, by Georg Wink, who is uh, here with us today. And one of the participants on the panel was the Brazilian sociologist, Esther Solano. She told us about the widespread notion documented in her ethnographic work among poor Brazilians, that their reason for giving their vote to Bolsonaro was that he, he was, oh God, Eli Edge Deus. And the Workers' Party and Bolsonaro's opponent, Fernando Haddad, was, according to them, against the family. What sort of cultural dynamics could underlie and sustain these simple but nonetheless common assumptions? I continue to ask myself after the conference in what ways the various types of Brazilian Christianity possibly could have contributed to the electoral victory of the right-wing populism in the form of Bolsonaro. Moreover, I also thought about which kind of religious impulses that led to the instrumental role of the evangelical bloc, a bancada evangelica, in the National Congress in Brazil during the impeachment process of Dilma Rousseff in 2016, and the U-turn of Brazilian politics that had been dominated by the govern governance of the Workers' Party since 2003. As I worked on this research problem, I was well aware that religion was not the only factor in play, probably not the most important factor either. One symptom of this seemed to be the fact that the former president, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, was leading on the polls in early 2018, in spite of having been convicted for corruption, incarcerated, 
and eventually hindered from posing as a presidential candidate for the Workers' Party. In other words, Lula had an appeal that made allegations against the Workers' Party of being against religion or in favor of dismantling the traditional Christian family altogether less central for the outcome of the elections. But having hindered Lula from running against Bolsonaro, the latter politician had gained a unique momentum, it seemed, and the disinformation about the Workers' Party's political intentions could gain more credibility. Three days before the most polarized election in the history of Brazil's young democracy, a video making controversial claims about one of the presidential candidates appeared on Facebook. Look at what the Workers' Party is putting in creases, read the caption. The minute long video accuses the Workers' Party's candidate Fernando Haddad, who lost the election by six percentage points of planning to distribute baby bottles with penis shaped teats. This kind of coordinated misinformation was spread even more efficiently on WhatsApp, the Facebook owned encrypted message messaging service where the movement of misinformation is untraceable. Anyhow, the association made between this video and Bolsonaro's opponent seemed to be effective. It was built and founded on the impression that Malafaya, the, the impression that Malafaya and other influential public religious figures in Brazil were eager to make, that the true Christians had for years been under attack from an atheist leftist elite, crystallized in government initiatives from the Workers' Party government up to 2016, such as the highly con controversial Escola Same Homophobia, a school without homophobia. When I formulated the title of my article in Iberoamericana as the political conditions and the theological foundations of the new Christian right in Brazil, I was aware that the very idea of a Christian right in Brazil could be controversial in current scholarship on religion and politics in Brazil. Scholars such as Paul Freston and David Lehrman had warned against applying the parallel of the Christian right in the United States to the Brazilian case. For some years, I had been open to the idea that what we were witnessing with the rise of evangelical politics in Brazil would produce something very different from the Christian right in the US. After all, evangelical politicians connected to Edir Macedo's neo-Pentecostal Church Igreja Universal do Reino de Deus had been allies to the government of the Workers' Party, and Macedo himself had taken a rather low profile in the cultural war issues such as LGBT rights and abortion. The politicized evangelical Christianity in Brazil appeared much less unified than the Christian right in the US. Besides, there was a huge difference in the conditions for a, a religiously based politics in Brazil than in the US. While the Christian right in the US mobilized politically for the Republican party, the party landscape in Brazilian politics was much more fragmentary. After the removal of Dilma Rousseff in 2016, however, major shifts in evangelical politics in Brazil took place. The majority of evangelical politicians pushed the politics to the right through outright hostility to the political left. They tended to be more uniform on moral and sexual issues, and they moved in political directions that were identical to the Christian rights in the US, such, such as unreserved support for the state of Israel. And more importantly, the major religious leaders within evangelical Christianity embraced the same presidential candidate, just eight days before the primary round on the, of the presidential elections in 2018, the neo-Pentecostal Bishop Eder Macedo openly declared his support for Bolsonaro. Here at Macedo is in the first line with Bolsonaro at the day for the celebration of Brazil's independence in 2019. This coincidence, or perhaps more rightly, this coordination of support for Bolsonaro left the impression of a more unified evangelical front backed up by certain Catholic groups that now could be termed 
a Christian right, with all the connotations to the counterpart in the United States that you may think of and which calls for comparisons. Take a look at this figure. These are numbers of the population in various Latin American countries that report that they attend a church at least once a week. In the Nordic countries, these numbers will be from three up to perhaps 5% more or less in similar st statistics. In Brazil, the number in this Pew report from 2014 is 45% of the population that reports attending a church at least once a week. This shows that the religious activity in Christian churches and the level of attendance among Brazilians is high. And this further indicates that the churches are of high importance and central arenas for everyday social socialization, and partly also for evolvement of political attitudes. Now, I'm a theologian and I come from the field of political theology. Central to my argument for a new Christian right in Brazil nowadays are my hypotheses of the existence of various political theologies that are influential on the minds of voters, clergy, and politicians alike. The political scientist, Amy Erica Smith, has produced one of the few English-speaking monographs on the political role of Christian churches in recent electoral processes in Brazil. Her scheme of the three levels of evangelical influence in politics is particularly useful in order to conceptualize how theological ideas about politics and, government and governments shape Brazilians' politics nowadays, for better or for worse. By political theology, I mean a set of ideas about the political that presuppose a notion of the divine, be it a divine will about how society should be governed or how God is acting through political parties, agents, or movements. Such theologies can be explicit or implicit in politics, and they are often expressed in fragmentary forms due to the circumstances that could make it opportune for a political agent to make an argument that presuppose the existence of a divine will or divine governance of any kind. In a country like Brazil, where roughly 90% of the population identify themselves with Christianity in some or other form, these theologies are justified with Christian ideas. As a theologian, I have elaborated three typologies of political theologies that I suggest are influential in Brazilian politics and constitute the theological core or foundation of the new Christian right in Latin America's biggest economy. And these political theologies, they can be communicated, preached, disseminated on various levels. First, you have the level of the clergy with their theology, their preaching, and then you have the level of the congregants, their everyday socialization, their reception of what is said, what occurs in the churches. And then you have the politicians that respond to the clergy as well as the congregants. But research shows that they tend to privilege the agendas of the clergy uh, because the, the access that the clergy has to the congregants, the voters, is of high importance um, to them. Now, for the three typologies I have been working with here in order to sustain my thesis of a new Christian right in Brazil, first, we have what I call the neoliberal supernaturalism. Neo-Pentecostalism, it is epitomized in the prosperity gospel in uh, the figure of a powerful preacher like Eder Macedo that you see here. And he represents what I label neoliberal supernaturalism. Although, although Macedo endorsed Bolsonaro's candidacy a few days ahead of the election in 2018, the influence of his 
theology um, and the theology that the church disseminates is of a more indirect kind. I ar argue that the church makes voters receptive to the political right through the worldview that it disseminates through its adaption of North American prosperity theology. Modern capitalism is made into the self-given framework in which the divine operates and prosperity gospel alleviates the believer from any suspicion that the economic system itself may be contrary to the divine will and order of this world. Neoliberal supernaturalism is predisposed to serve the tacit support of the Christian right to the liberalization of the market economy bypassing questions of economic redistribution and workers' rights. The invisible hand of the market is in this theological universe no other than God's hand. Second, intention, but also in a certain overlap to neoliberal supernaturalism is what can be termed apocalyptic dualism. While the prosperity gospel serves as a tacit support of an undercurrent of an official political discourse, there, there is an equal dualistic spiritualization of politics in Brazilian Pentecostalism that is explicit and unreserved in its endorsements of political candidates. Silas Malafaia represents the more traditional form of Pentecostalism that are more apocalyptically oriented, and in this way has a tendency to, to, inter, to interpret politics through a sharp dualism that demonize political opponents, particularly political leftism, exemplified in this harsh condemnation of Malafaya or the Workers' Party that I show here. It militantly defends a moral conservatism in the name of God and explicitly endorses specific political candidates in times of elections. Third, there is a kind of a Catholic neoconservatism exemplified by, for instance, Padre Ricardo. And this kind of neoconservatism does not embrace specific political candidates. This is a rather ordinary priest formally, and he does not possess a higher authority in the Catholic Church, but nonetheless enjoys a wide impact in social media on, and on internet with his theologically based anti-workers party discourse that is inspired by Bolsonaro's mentor, Olavo de Carvalho, and his polemic against the so-called cultural Marxism which they believe to be present nearly everywhere, not least in Catholic groups sympathetic to the causes of the political left. And here in this quote, Padre Paulo Ricardo refers to liberation theology as one supreme example of cultural Marxism that is to be eradicated according to God's will. After the publication of this article, I continue to ask myself whether the Christian right in Brazil is a vulnerable alliance between a political madman from the right and rather opportunistic evangelical leaders that are soon to run out of gas and political capital, or whether the new Christian right we have witnessed so far is more of a solid and permanent power base for the Bolsonarismo that has come to stay for the next decade or so. And as someone who has traveled around Latin America to get to know Catholic-based communities built up by liberation theolo theologians, with Brazil as the heartland of the Christian movement, I wonder what happened to all the energy, the costly activity, the intellectual openness and the political mobilization of liberation theology in Brazil that theoretically seem to be the perfect match or case for a new Christian left. But that only seems to be in theory, since it is not clear to me to what extent the Brazilian left will be able to successfully mobilize against Bolsonarismo based on religion. Thank you for listening. There you are.
Uh, thank you very much, Ule Jokov. Great presentation. Uh, and let us then turn to our commenters. Uh, Elina Bola, would you have a question to ask to Ule? Uh, well, thanks first for inviting me to discuss this really interesting and informative article that I think, Ulla Jakob, your article really makes clear what theological perspectives can bring to the field of Latin American studies, especially the study of religion in the Latin American context. And by that, I mean uh, specifically theological ideas uh, that you so well present. Uh, I have prepared a short commentary based on your article and your talk today. And in the end, I have uh, two questions for you. Uh, as you rightly point out in the article and, and in your speech today, liberation theology uh, was very influential, especially in Brazil, and has had direct influence on also on uh, Brazilian politics. I would like to continue your line of thought based on my own research. Many claim that liberation theology is dead not just in Brazil, but all over Latin America, something that I disagree on and have written on that elsewhere. However, it is clear that liberation theology is not the same what it used to be until roughly the 1990s. And that is due not only to huge societal and political changes in the region, but also to internal reasons. By internal, I mean, uh, developments within uh, churches, especially the Catholic Church, and second, developments within liberation theology as a current of thought and academic theorizing. Uh, among the first, the suppression of liberation theology by the church hierarchy, both internationally and locally, is of course important. And uh, the hierarchy's support for conservative tendencies like Catholic charismatic renewal, uh, which also was born as a response to the growth of evangelical charismatic churches in the region. A crucial part of this move uh, is the strengthening of traditional Catholic positions on women's roles, the family and reproductive issues, and an open opposition to any sort of feminism. But second, a less analyzed reason for the declining of the liberation theology is its internal development during uh, the first years of democracy. And by that, I mean the delegitimation of the churches previously close linked to popular movements and organizations, not just the base communities, but that society at large. Liberation theology lost its primary base, both in the church and the society. And I argue that it is due to liberation, liberation theology's own inability to recognize and support new social movements with new issues about democracy and human rights, such as the ecological movement, indigenous movements, and maybe most importantly, feminist and LGBT movements. The failure of, failure of liberation theology to continue its intimate link to social movements in new forms is not for the hierarchy of the church to blame, but it is a practical and theoretical failure of liberation theology itself. Liberation theologians were by and large unable to recognize the new social movements demands for an understanding of democracy. Politics understood also as something personal sexual and reproductive rights as issues of democracy and equality. Thus, willingly or unwillingly, liberation theology ended up siding with the traditional Catholic teachings, at least in the area of reproductive uh, uh, and sexual ethics. And this in turn created a vacuum between progressive sectors of the Catholic Church and the civil society uh, organizations earlier occupied by liberation theology with its firm base at the grassroots level, fostering democracy during the dictatorships. The feminist movement of Latin America, including Brazil, 
once working at the auspices of the church in many countries, became more anti-Catholic and secular, an unfortunate development in the sense that, it too, that at the same time, the feminist movement may have lost much of its support among the more women for whom religion is important. Linked to the former, one of the markers of the Christian right globally is in its focus, and I, one could say its obvious obsession with gender issues, women's roles, and sexuality, as you point out in your article. However, these patriarchal values and viewpoints are by no way a new phenomenon, which the so-called Christian right would have invented during the last decades. The binary understanding of men and women, their different roles in the church, uh, society, and the family are at the core of classical Christian teaching, whether Catholic or Protestant. Feminist theologians from different faith traditions have during decades made clear how this kind of thinking is pervasive in all Christian churches, uh, as well as many other faith traditions. Within Christian churches, the opposition to homosexuality, abortion, and other reproductive rights, uh, as well as seeing motherhood as women's primary identity and role, and a strict division of roles and authority between men and women uh, have been and is mainstream teaching still today in most Christian churches. It is primarily only some mainline Protestant churches, including the Nordic Lutheran churches, that have revised their teaching on these issues. So I think it's important to put this in perspective that these neoconservative rights also in Brazil have a long history behind them. It's not a new phenomenon. Uh, the Catholic Church, even during Pope Francis, has not changed its teaching at all in these issues by the con to, to the contrary. Further, these sorts of thoughts were also pretty much reproduced in most of liberation theology, unfortunately. Uh, at worst, liberation theology linked uh, claims for reproductive and sexual rights and women's equality to anti-imperialist thoughts. Questions on re of reprodu rep reproduction and sexuality and women's rights were considered by some liberation theologians as part of the Western colonialist imperialist influence on the, <clears throat> on the Latin American poor. They totally closed their eyes on the clear link between poverty and reproductive and sexual rights of women and the horrific results of that in unnecessary deaths of primarily poor women in Latin America. I would argue that this is due to two things. First, that the most influential liberation theologians simply continued and reproduced the age-old patriarchal legacy of the Christian tradition, uh, very alive in the Catholic Church. But they also did this with a new, specifically liberation theological twist. Demands for sexual and reproductive rights were seen as another intent of the West over the poor of the global South. And second, as I already pointed out, uh, and this is possibly of more interest for our discussion today, the detachment of liberation theology from new civil society organizations and movements, including women's uh, and feminist organization in post-dictatorship uh, Brazil and Latin America. So my questions to you and our discussion would be, First, if there is a link between this self-sustained decline of liberation theology and its detachment of new social movements and the growth of the sort of tendencies described and analyzed by you in your article, this would be interesting to discuss. Did they, these uh, neo-evangelical churches, at least partly fill a vacuum left by liberation theology and the previously democratizing role of parts of the Catholic Church. And the second issue that we might 
want to discuss uh, is that the patriarchal ecumenism, a term that I have coined, is something that we see today in both conservative Catholic and evangelical uh, traditions. How to tackle it if Latin American feminist theorizing and activism are overtly anti-religious? And if progressive sectors of the churches are hesitant to create any uh, alliances with feminist and LGBT movements. Thus, in a way, I would add to your fantastic uh, list of typologies of political theologies, uh, yet another that we might call patriarchal ecumenism, uh, cross-cutting, I would say the tree, but I would be very interested to hear what you have to say about that. Thank you, obrigada. Uh, thank you, Lina. Just one question, Ole, what would you prefer? Should we, should you, would you want to answer now or should we take Georg's questions and then you answer to both? I think we should take uh, Georg's uh, intervention first right. and then uh, continue. Okay, Georg, shoot. Yes, thank you. So, um, uh, Ole, that's really a brilliant article that uh, perfectly synthesizes uh, these new dynamics. And uh, from my point of view, and for the research I'm doing on Brazilian conservatism, I think it's really especially relevant that you included um, conservative Catholicism. I think we can call it conservative because it's actually a continuity. There's not so much neo about it, uh, like uh, uh, it has been mentioned before. And um, uh, these, these conservative uh, Catholics, um, they go underestimated for various reasons. So one is, of course, the wrong belief that Catholic leaders are somehow leftists. And of course, that's uh, due to uh, liberation theology and maybe also a bit um, an overhyping of the hegemony of uh, liberation theology by the conservatives because uh, as a threat, of course, right? And on the other hand, we have a very long conservative Catholic tradition since the foundation of the Republic, right? Since the end of the 19th century. Then the, the prejudice that Catholic voters are not seen as manipulated, just like uh, uh, evangelical voters, for example, because they are better educated, wealthier, more urban, whiter also than Pentecostals, right? Which makes them strangely also vote for Bolsonaro. And in the South and the Southeast, the economically uh, strongest regions, it's up to 62%, right, of the Catholic voters who voted for Bolsonaro. So uh, your 50% is quite optimistic as national average, right? But it's, I think it's worse actually. And then also, uh, uh, I think it's underestimated um, uh, because of the fact that conservative Catholics don't do open politics, and they never did so since the restoration in the 1920s uh, through the Catholic action strategy, it was always about mobilization of the political elite as discreet as possible. So they never funded a, a party like Pentecostals of, did several times. They funded, and that's very telling, uh, what they called election league. So they certified candidates. So they issued like uh, certifications, you can vote in that one. And, but they always kept behind the curtains and they do so today exactly, uh, except for charismatic figures like uh, Paulo Ricardo, who you mentioned, but even, even he, he targets the urban middle class, right? And um, yeah, there is a, a, a record of success stories of uh, the conservative Catholics, which goes almost forgotten, forgotten today, so the influence they had on the new state of Getulio Vargas, uh, uh, they actually um, uh, determined uh, uh, Vargas policies to a large degree and the, the role they played before the military coup also and uh, during the constitutional assembly of the late eighties. So they, they really won a lot of battles, but it's, it's not that known because um, yeah, uh, they don't really promote it. Um, uh, it's also not widely known that they are actually quite rich, um, um, not personal uh, wealth like the, the Pentecostal uh, uh, leaders. But uh, if you are interested, uh, put on, on YouTube, Heralds of the Gospel. 
And then you can see some of these castles they built uh, in the mountains close to Sao Paulo, because for almost a, a full century, they have been um, sponsored by the economic uh, elite of Sao Paulo, right? So um, what uh, I have two remarks, uh, very short and feel welcome to comment on them. So um, uh, one thing is that the conservative Catholics are in my eyes possibly having even a bigger impact on the question of democracy, uh, which was uh, um, an issue you, you raised in your article, because, and yeah, let's see if you agree or if both of you agree. Uh, I think Pentecostals are beneficiaries from democracy. They play along the rules because they benefit from the rules. And um, the rules fit their strategy or vice versa. So it's the lobbying, it's the event campaigning, it's the use of media, uh, it's the self-financing through the followers and so on. And um, also uh, the, the, the federalism in, in Brazil uh, meets uh, their needs, right? Because they are so um, diverse, right? It's so many different organizations. And uh, even though they promote, of course, anti-democratic, authoritarian, discriminatory values, I think they might be even less dangerous uh, than the uh, uh, conservative Catholics because they they are not they don't have a nationally coordinated agenda they don't have a vision for the whole country, and because they adapt um, uh, uh, like uh, uh, the political action depends on who is who will probably win the elections and then they align right it's they they are governistas whoever wins the election they somehow try to participate in power. And um, uh, the conservative Catholics, they, they welcome the evangelical vote and of course also the legislative action of the uh, bloc, but only as uh, a supporter, um, uh, it's a strategical uh, decision, right? Um, they are union partners. They are actually the ones who do the dirty job and coordinate the masses and provide the votes, right? It's a bit like uh, the conserv conservative Catholics did in the 1930s with the integralists also. Um, so uh, what's dangerous about the Catholics, of course, the fraction of the conservative Catholics is that they want to change the system radically. And I think no Pentecostal political branch really wants to do that. And, um, of course, not themselves, their political allies, like in your, um, the politicians they, they, they support, um, because in, in, in their eyes, democracy is the terrorism of the majority and the political system must obey the natural law. Um, so um, they, they fully support Bolsonaro in, in this culture war, which is a demolition of structures actually, right? And therefore, it makes no sense to accuse conservative Catholics of being anti-democratic, anti-modernist, anti-scientist, medieval. They, they would happily agree on all that, right? Mostly maybe because they would probably say that the late Middle Ages already suffered from degeneration, Gnostic thinking, lack, lack of harmony of spiritual and temporal power and so on. But as soldiers of God, they have the mission to save Christianity, right? And... Um, uh, the current government would never affirm this because it would be suicide policies, but uh, they accept the premises of the conservative Catholics about the roots of all problems, which is modernization as a degeneration process triggered by communism from Luther to Biden. That's the long story of communism. I'm finishing and the enemy must be fought through a culture war, right? And the last uh, remark uh, is, um, how a conservative Catholicism tries to encompass your very interesting uh, theological typology acting actually on all fronts. So that's also about the neoliberal supernaturalism. So uh, how uh, conservative Catholics claim actually that the late scholastics created the basis for liberal thinking. So that, that's one point how they get into that. And the other point uh, the apocalyptic dualism. I think that's also quite interesting. You have a wonderful quote in your article about um, uh, the passive attitude of just accepting or fighting. And uh, the, the conservative Catholics, they created the uh, interim kingdom of Mary for that purpose, uh, 
um, in order to uh, give the message that uh, we shouldn't accept world communism and wait for the apocalypse. Um, we should fight communism as a little apocalypse, what they call uh, la bagarre, uh, and enjoy then Mary's earthly temporal paradise before the second coming of Jesus, right? So I think that's also something quite interesting to, to discuss. Thank you. Over to you, William. You're gone. Thank you so much for two very interesting uh, and, uh, and substantial interventions uh, in, this, uh, in this field of, uh, of study. Um, I agree with both of you in, in various ways. Um, uh, first to you, um, Elena, I, I agree about the inability of liberation theology to support new social movements, um, such as uh, LGBT rights, feminist uh, movements. Uh, and I think that was, uh, was uh, a decision made on various levels. The liberation theology was, of course, very ambitious uh, because it uh, aimed at transforming society and making revolution within the church at once. And as a radical minority in the Catholic Church, they uh, they were largely unsuccessful uh, in that uh, that way. And I think many of the liberation theologians they they privileged uh, the program of changing the official positions of the church, and they went very far in in that struggle. And it went on the cost of their grassroots involvement um, and also uh, with their um, with their engagement for the civil society causes um, that moved farther and farther away from the traditional Catholic uh, agenda for instance in the in the form uh, that has a long history in a country like Argentina but we saw the effect just uh, some weeks ago uh, that the Argentinian feminists, they, they won the struggle for, for uh, legal ab abortion in Argentina. And I think your analysis would fit very well into those countries with that kind of, of uh, political and cultural history where you see the, the strength of those uh, social movements. But I mean, Argentina and Chile, they are in a very different cultural situation from the one we are witnessing in, in, um, in Brazil, where counter-reactionary uh, uh, forces, as described just now by uh, Georg, exemplified by the, these uh, conservative Catholic groups, they are so much uh, stronger. And I think at some point, and this is where I, I agree with Georg's uh, um, discourse as well, at some point, liberation bec uh, theology becomes a too big placeholder for exp uh, explaining what went wrong or what, what went well, because uh, liberation theology consists of a marginal group of Catholics in its inception, and it was marginalized by ecclesial and political authorities, sometimes violently over the years. And, and um, and it's, uh, I think its influence was exaggerated in many ways, as Georg says. Uh, and I think this is partly due to the, the, the spectacular form of it that really uh, gave ray, uh, rise to thought among uh, scholars and academians. I mean, here we have a, a movement, uh, a Catholic movement to embrace and Marxist guerrillas and want to liberate the poor. Wow, let's go there and see what this is. And it generated a, a huge amount of academic uh, literature that weren't really um, proportional to the social influence it had. And Pentecostalism grew as a mass movement, sort of kind of unnoticed for, for many years among scholars until it was so big that 
that we could not uh, escape it anymore and ha had to begin to, to study it, although we didn't always sympathize uh, uh, with it. So the kind of uh, conservative Catholicism that sustains the Christian right to Brazil, is it new or is it old? Well, I agree that many aspects of the ideology is not new at all. But what I argue in the article is that the, inter the, the, the overlapping of interests between these, uh, these evangelical groups who are on the rise and these conservative um, Catholics, it's new. And it's similar to what we have seen in the United States in, in several uh, ways. I mean, in both the national context, although at different, um, different times, the Catholics have been sitting watching these eager, active evangelicals, admiring them for their militancy, and then joining the, uh, the struggle in this uh, intense, uh, intolerant cultural war, which has created a new dynamic uh, in, uh, in Brazil that were not as uh, visible and evident uh, just a few years ago. It's very interesting that the point you make about uh, the Catholics, these conservative Catholics relation to, to democracy. And I think that's one of the big questions for research in years to come. Uh, to reflect uh, more on this, um, because it's it's evident that in many ways the the Pentecostals are uh, beneficials of democracy in ways that these conservative Catholics uh, are not, and 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 I understand they are operating in discrete ways, and that's part of the problem for research as well. I mean, we are indeed in lack of a solid monograph of this kind of counter-reactionary Brazilian conservatism in English. We would need that. So uh, thank you uh, so much for uh, valuable uh, ideas and interventions. Thank you, Ule Jacob. And I totally agree with you on, uh, on the continuity of this research along that line. Uh, there is a question here from the public. We just have 10 minutes left. Uh, so we need a bit of a quick answer. Uh, but the question here is from uh, Adriana Camp. Why do you think that we choose to join the Pentecostals when theology of liberation made a choice for the poor? And what do you think the progressive churches need to do to reach the poor? Let me just take another one here. So we take the two, and I think this will be the final here with your answer. Ule, could you please comment a little bit more on the concept of political theology? Does it only apply to institutional politics? And if not, are the theologies to which it doesn't apply? And this is uh, from uh, Olivia Forat. So I think there are more questions, but we take these two. I don't think we have more time with that. Let's see how it goes. The word to you, Ule. I'm sure Elena and Gil can, uh, can add uh, into this, uh, but I think one of the main reasons uh, why liberation theology lacked appeal among the poor masses was its, its uh, ambitious political form that was directed towards the ecclesial and political elites in the various national contexts in, um, in a very enlightened, critical, uh, modern form that was so foreign and alien to popular Catholicism, that, I mean, the common religious practices of poor people. And Pentecostalism communicated much better and connected with the, these popular practices of, of historical Catholicism in a much deeper and, and uh, emotional uh, ways. And I've heard liberation theologians um, making self-criticism about this, acknowledging that we we did not communicate this the, the these ecstatic emotional dimensions of the Christian faith that people were were seeking, and which is uh, is there, uh, and the result was um, 
Pentecostalisms that were conservative politically in many forms together with the Catholic charismatic renewal uh, that uh, was somewhat uh, unpolitical, but had also these uh, conservative effects on, on society and public uh, opinion. So there was um, um, a lack of appeal there uh, in the very form of, of the movement. Now, political theology is something that I understand to be uh, a, a way of analyzing any kind of interaction between religion and, and politics as a, as a theologian. And so what I, I hypothesize about a political theology in the discourse of, let's say, Jair Bolsonaro or in the discourse of Joe Biden, or in any political discourse on the grassroots level or elite level, where um, political ideas are connected with theological ideas about, about the divine, about the biblical histories, and so on. Okay, thank you. Maybe we have time for a last uh, question here from Patricia Lorenzoni, which is, uh, uh, it, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on the kind of evangelical violences that have got increasing media attention with the traficantes evangelicals and the violence against the condomble practitioners. Do you have any comment on that? Can I add, I don't have an answer to that, but could I add to, to the previous question uh, shortly? I totally agree with Ule Very Jakob. Brief, yeah. Yeah, Ulla Jakob uh, to the question of uh, why the charismatic uh, Pentecostalism and evangelical movements are growing. But, you know, we have to remember that it's also, it's a global phenomenon. So it's not spe something specifically Latin American. Uh, it's the fastest growing uh, religion in uh, so sub-Saharan uh, Africa, for example. So there must be reasons that are not uh, region specific even though there, there certainly are also region-specific reasons for, for its appeal. And I think uh, Ule Jakob mentioned some. There, there have been studies on uh, this. Why do people join? Why do poor people find it attractive? And there are many explanations. There are also very interesting gender-specific uh, explanations that it wouldn't cross our minds first that women might find it more women friendly than the traditional Catholic church, including the liberation theological version of it. So that is one factor um, that has been highlighted in research. Yeah, do you want to comment on that, Ule, Jakob? Uh, I just want to uh, give a preliminary answer to the to the last question about the new evangelical intolerance that we um, are now um, having reports of from Brazilian media in, for instance, uh, uh, favelas with uh, um, with um, armed armed groups uh, taking up the banner of uh, evangelicalism and even the, the flag of the state of Israel and these symbols of this, um, these new kinds of Pentecostalisms. I mean, uh, I try to argue that, that the, um, the new Christian right in Brazil, it displays some of the authoritarian and even violent potential that uh, Christianity uh, has in uh, in itself, in in the, it, its resources for for um, uh, for a wider range of of ideas, and I mean, in, in a society in which Pentecostals are a tiny minority, uh, it uh, it will indeed be very dangerous to to set yourself in that position of uh, of. Uh, using violence in the form that we see now. But as Pentecostalism gains more and more ground, is on the rise in a country like uh, Brazil, it is also a source of a new power, a new social status, a social capital that these um, armed groups now seem to, seem to take in, in 
in uh, spectacular and partly shocking ways. And this, this uh, we also have reports that religious intolerance is increasing uh, and, and there is a higher amount of cases in which evangelicals are those who exert the kind of religious intolerance and the victims are adherents to Afro-Brazilian religions such as Candomblé and that is a, a, a very new tendency that we have seen over the last years. Well, thank you, Ule Jakob. Unfortunately, we have to end here this event. I think there is a lot of food for thought and inspiration for continuous research on this issue. Uh, actually, I, it came to my mind, the, the, the first time I met all of you had been in one of our Nordic uh, conferences, Elina in the first one in Stockholm and uh, Ule and George in, in Oslo. Uh, for all of you that don't know this, we will have another NOLAN in next year in Helsinki. It will be a, a conference for Nordic and European Latin Americanists, where maybe, hopefully, we might have a, a workshop or a seminar on the issue of religion in Latin America. So, we, all, we already did it. We'll, we put it together today. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, uh, keep up uh, your uh, view on our homepage and uh, you will have more information on this issue. And of course, read the uh, Iberoamericana concerning the articles and publications. A great thing to Christina Neval. It was her idea actually to, to do this and to highlight one of the articles. And we are really proud and happy to have had this article in our journal. Thanks to Ula Jakob and really proud of this great Nordic uh, research seminar and all, all these scholars. So thank you all very much. And of course, thank, thank, you. thank you very much to our public that have been here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye, Bart. You too. Thank Bye. You.